Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Goldstein. I'm the programming curator here at Roosevelt House, and I welcome you here on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, who can't be here this evening, and also Harold Holzer, who is the Jonathan Fanton director of Roosevelt House, who is uh, in Albany uh, this evening. So uh, we're very excited to have Ken White here to talk about his biography of Hoover, and also to have Amity Schles here to interview him. Uh, you can imagine that this is not a house in which Herbert Hoover is historically or in the present day talked about often or uh, usually uh, too kindly. Uh, so one thing that I want to say about uh, Ken, Ken White in the introduction to his book says that uh, indictment and advocacy shape and often overwhelm the story of the man, Herbert Hoover. And I think there's probably been more indictment of Herbert Hoover in, in these halls uh, than anywhere else, uh, perhaps, because Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt lived here uh, in New York in this house during the 1932 campaign. So I think we'll hear a different story of the 1932 campaign than you might have heard them uh, interpret it as being. Uh, we, we met earlier in the Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt Library on the second floor, um, which is where Franklin Roosevelt met with prospective cabinet members after the 1932 election. Uh, so I have a feeling they were talking about uh, just what a bad job Herbert Hoover had been doing. Uh, but I think we'll hear a very different story tonight. Uh, as Kirkus Reviews has said, about uh, Ken White's biography. He call, they called it an intensely researched, thoughtful resurrection of a brilliant man. So we're very eager to hear about uh, what his interpretation of uh, Herbert Hoover is, and especially his uh, role in the Great Depression. Uh, one of the wonderful things about having Amity Schles here is that she too brings a very different perspective on the period than we, well, applause for, for Amity Schles. Thank you. Um, one, one thing that, um, that Ms. Schles wrote in, nine, in 2009 in the Washington Post is that, like no other president, Roosevelt inspired those in despair. But Roosevelt, the economist, is unworthy of emulation. Again, not something you usually hear discussed here, but we're very happy to bring that perspective uh, to you and to have her here uh, as well. Uh, she uh, is the author of four New York Times bestsellers, including The Forgotten Man, uh, which is a, 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 the new his, excuse me, I'm gar garbling my speech. Uh, the Forgotten Man, A New History of the Great Depression, uh, which was also a New York Times bestseller in its graphic form. Uh, so uh, it, was, it was text and then uh, a cartoon version uh, of the book. Well, it's demeaning to call it a cartoon version, but I think even graphic novelists do refer to their work as cartoons, so um, I, that's my defense. Um, and she is also the author of the best-selling biography of Calvin Coolidge, another president we do not hear too much about in uh, this home. Uh, Amity Schles is also the board, chair of the Board of Trustees of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation. So before I turn it over to Amity Schles and to Ken White, I want to say that we also have in the house this evening the great-granddaughter of Herbert Hoover, Margaret Hoover, and we're honored to have her here for this conversation. Thank you, Ms. Hoover, for being here. She, she's, she's at the back of, of, of the house. Uh, thank you all, as I say, for being here. After the conversation, there'll be a Q&A, and then after that, I invite you upstairs to the Four Freedoms Rooms the former dining rooms of the house uh, to uh, have a reception and a book signing. Mr. White will be uh, signing copies of his book. Uh, thank you very much all for being here. And I turn it over to Amity Schles and to Ken White. Thank you. Do we, do we use both mics at the same time like that? Yeah, both mics. Thank you. Um, I always knew the Roosevelts were gracious people and gracious entertainers, and, and Ken and I feel very welcome here, and we, we thank you for that. To be at Roosevelt House is an honor for both of us. My guest is Ken White. I want to add one or two words of biography about Ken um, to Bill's wonderful introduction. 
I will say there are newspaper people and there are newspaper innovators. Two classes, and newspaper innovators are rather rare. Mr. White falls into that second category. You know, he's published monthly, weekly, and daily periodicals. Um, a, a, that's a very broad range for a newspaper man or woman. He's also the founding editor of a deeply thoughtful, wonderful periodical, which we always admired and emulated here in the States, the National Post. He's edited Maclean's. He's been publisher of dozens of magazines uh, with Rogers Publishing, and, and that's important to know. It takes a great flexibility of mind and heroism to dare to be a publisher to nowadays as the medium changes so much. Ken is also the author of The Uncrowned King, a story, the story of William Randolph Hearst, um, and now Hoover, An Extraordinary Life in Extraordinary Times. Um, I believe Bill quoted the Kirkus review, which was lovely. Uh, you should know the Globe and Mail called your work, his work, monumental, this book. And the New Yorker called you implausible. And that, Ken, is a badge of honor. <laughs> We're going to speak about 30 minutes. Um, we want to welcome you in as fast as we can, and we'll move chronologically through what is a remarkable life and then open to questions. I think the first question so obviously is, today Hoover is ranked pretty low among presidents, for example. He was number 36 in one poll I looked up, the Siena College Research Institute poll. Um, so he's come down over time even, Ken, because he was 20 out of 32 in some of the early polls. Why Hoover? It's a pleasure to be here this evening and, and a pleasure to share the stage with Amity, who's one of my favorite authors uh, and a wonderful person. And uh, even if she did pick out the one negative word in a brilliant four-page review in The New Yorker... Um, <laughs> The um, Why Hoover? I didn't want to do Hoover uh, originally. I, I, I wanted to do a book about uh, uh, Belgium and the First World War, which Hoover was somewhat involved in. I'm not a fan of presidential biographies. Um, it's just not a genre that uh, I really take to. And uh, But my editor, who's here tonight, Andrew Miller, uh, talked me into it, and I'm really glad that he did, because as soon as I started looking uh, into Hoover's life, I, I, I didn't know anything about the guy except that, you know, he was this failed president, uh, number 36 in, in, the, in the rankings, and, uh, and apparently not uh, a, a very interesting person either. I couldn't have been more wrong in, in that assessment. Uh, when you just look at the basic arc of Hoover's life. Uh, he was born in West Branch, Iowa. I was out there just this week uh, and saw his, his birth home again, and um, it looks like a garden shack. It's probably smaller than the average one-car garage, and there was five people grew up in that little house. Uh, his, he came from nothing, and uh, not only that, was orphaned at the age of nine. Uh, and then shipped around to different branches of the family uh, before finally getting uh, off to Stanford University, first class at Stanford University. He was actually the first student at Stanford University. Graduates with a geology, uh, geology degree, becomes a miner, goes to Australia in his early 20s and finds the biggest gold mine in Australian history to that point goes to China, still in his 20, and pulls off the biggest mining transaction in the history of that country to that point. Then uh, he goes to London at the height of the Edwardian era, and he sets himself up as a global uh, mining tycoon and makes a fortune. Then the First World War happens. He emerges as uh, an international humanitarian and gains international fame in that role. When America enters the war, he returns to the United States and joins Woodrow Wilson's war cabinet as the food czar. He practically ran the whole food um, system for America during the course of the Great War. 
uh, when the war ends and uh, Wilson goes to Paris to negotiate the Versailles Treaty, Hoover goes with them. And while Wilson and the other leaders are hammering out the Versailles Treaty, Hoover has pretty much absolute control of the entire European economy. The New York Times called him the closest thing to a dictator that Europe had seen since Napoleon. Um, he uh, came back to America after uh, the Versailles Treaty. He ran for president uh, unsuccessfully in 1920. He served as the Commerce Secretary for Harding and for Coolidge, and then, of course, has his own term in office. And it was an amazing time to be president, just about five months after he is inaugurated the greatest economic disaster in the history of the United States and in the history of the world, the developed world anyway, uh, occurs on his watch and he spends three years fighting that. Uh, he loses office, he spends his years in the wilderness only to be resurrected again by Harry Truman in 1945. He serves Truman and then he serves Eisenhower as fourth and fifth presidents that he served at a very high level and uh, finishes his days fishing for bonefish in the Florida Keys, writing books three at a time in his desk in the Waldorf Towers uh, in this gorgeous suite with uh, the Prince of Wales and Cole Porter for neighbors. So that's not a bad arc to a life, is it? And, and as soon as I realized that about him, that there was so much drama, so much adventure, so many highs, so many lows. Uh, I was uh, kind of stunned that I'd stumbled onto this figure and, and actually been nudged towards writing about this figure who I should have seen from the start was an amazing human being and uh, really uh, an American unlike any other. So that's why that's Hoover. A, well, I think I'm turned off now. That was a wonderful tour. Just a few questions in the interview part now. <laughs> Tell us a little about how Hoover figured out what his career was. Because you know it was said of Hoover that he was the best paid young man of his generation. And that was because he was also the best situated and the one who could add the most value to a new industry. So tell us a little bit about that, um, college and then moving into mining. Um, Hoover, uh, <laughs> Hoover came out of college uh, with a drive that was almost inhuman and he was determined to succeed at almost any cost. The uh, one one view of him, Hoover has his detractors, he always ha also has his supporters, and the supporters tend to look at his business career as a sort of Horatio Alger story. You all know the Horatio Alger stories, you know, it's about a young man who, by virtue of his character and hard work, finds his way in the world and, and uh, does great things. Hoover owes more to the robber barons than he does to the Horatio Algers. Uh, he went to Australia uh, to be a miner uh, and hired a bunch of his Stanford buddies to come work with him there. There's letters that exist, uh, Hoover writing to his brother in California about how he was managing these uh, Stanford friends. Uh, in one letter, uh, Herbert Hoover says, I have Wilson here. Uh, he is going to dig this new mine, and he's going to dig it in record time. And if he doesn't, he's going to be back in the U.S. so fast and so poor he won't know where to eat. And that's how Hoover dealt with his friends. Um, there are reports of him in China uh, in negotiations to buy mining properties with a gun in his hand, waving it around, threatening to shoot whoever uh, would not uh, help him get his way. Um, he, was, he was a pretty ruthless uh, character as a businessman. The interesting thing about him, though, is that while he was, and this is 
common to a lot of the robber barons while they were doing um, their you know corporate uh, depredations, they were also uh, doing some good in the world. And Hoover, while uh, he he was going around um, uh, making making his fortune, um, he um, was also supporting back in California a lot of people. Uh, uh, fellow students and family members. Uh, he was paying the salary of a librarian at Stanford. He was uh, donating rare books and Jesuit publications that he'd picked up in China to Stanford. Most remarkably, uh, there was a guy in London, an accountant for the firm that Hoover worked at, who uh, embezzled a ton of money from the firm and almost put it out of business, went to jail, and Hoover uh, decided to uh, uh, support the man's wife and child so that they could maintain their standard of living while the guy was in jail. So he was doing a lot of um, what we might call dastardly things in the business world, but at the same time doing a lot uh, of good simultaneously. Oh, that that's... It, that's a, it's sort of like a cowboy, right? There's a theme here, though, that we'll come back to later, which is if you were on Hoover's team, he was tough on you, but he really valued loyalty. It was his people versus the world. And you, you, can, you can see that um, very early. I am the devil to other people, but I am the angel to us. Um, Tell us a little bit, um, rather than China, I'm going to go to Europe. He's a successful, basically, investment banker in a certain area, his area, mining, with a very successful firm. And at a relatively young age, he declares himself almost ready to retire and moves into the whirlwind of World War I, seeing the starving Belgians and deciding he will take that project on in such a huge way. Please um, tell ab us about that, including operating outside the law and his, and his opponents, and there were many and respectable ones in this endeavor. Yeah, Hoover had pretty much made his fortune by the time he was in his mid to late 30s and uh, had decided at the same time that he wanted to be more than a rich man. Um, I talk about the tension in his perso personality between the, the ruthless businessman and the guy who wanted to do good in the world. Well, that better side of his nature does come forward through his 30s and into his 40s. Uh, he's older, he's more mature, he's got a wife and uh, children, and he's a little bit embarrassed by some of the things that he did in his business career. Um, so he looks for an opportunity to get into public service. And when the First World War broke out, um, one of the first events of the war was, of course, that Germany invaded France, and it did it through Belgium. It occupied Belgium in, in the initial weeks of the war. And Hoover uh, learned from friends in London that one of the consequences of German occupation of Belgium was that the food supply was essentially cut off. The nation before the war had uh, imported about 80% of its food, and suddenly uh, the, the um, supply lines were blocked by Britain, which blockaded uh, Belgium, and uh, the Germans didn't see it as their job to feed uh, a captive people. So the Belgians had nothing to eat. Hoover then spent the next uh, three years building the Commission for the Relief of Belgium, which uh, was a really phenomenal logistic feat. It, it was a world war. There were no ships. There was no surplus food. There was no surplus cash. Yet he managed to get from all around the world enough grains and enough meat to keep 8 million Belgians alive through the course of the war and a couple of million in northern France as well. It was uh, just a colossal uh, humanitarian endeavor, uh, saving the lives of 8 to 10 million people in a war that killed about 10 million people. And it was the sort of thing that only somebody uh, with Hoover's business capacities uh, and his sheer will could have pulled off, because the Germans didn't want the Belgians uh, being fed by external forces and being uh, 
dependent on anyone but the Germans, and, and the British didn't want the food going into Belgium because they thought that the Germans just steal it to feed themselves and it was going to be a long war of attrition, so that wasn't a good thing. Hoover bullied these guys, the generals, the heads of state, he bullied them, he lied to them. All of the um, sort of reprehensible practices that he used to use in business, he now used in the cause of his humanitarianism, and he pulled off this fantastic feat of humanitarianism. And over the next uh, decades of his life uh, beyond Belgium, after the First World War, uh, after the Second World War, he was credited with uh, saving in his humanitarian endeavors somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 or 100 million people. And when you go to the Hoover Institution in California, they have a beautiful exhibit of the gifts that people sent to President Hoover to thank him, thank him embroidered grain bags, uh, using the little resources they had to show um, their deep gratitude to him, but uh, but it was controversial. Food is fungible, right? So that, that was quite tough. I want to move to Versailles because you have a strong um, financial expertise, Ken. And at Versailles, there were basically a bunch of people who didn't quite know what they were doing. We know that, right? and especially not on the financial end. And then you had also a lot of anger, right? F France is not going to let Germany get away without being impaled. And most of the people are intriguing. They're, um, they're counterproductive, to put it in modern therapy language. Uh, you know, they're intriguing. They're skullduggery. 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 And then there's Hoover, and of all people, Maynard Keynes took a look at the crowd of people who are supposed to save the world by writing meaningful treaties and observed that Hoover was the exception. He said, Hoover imported into the councils of Paris precisely that atmosphere of reality, knowledge, magnanimity, and disinterestedness, which, if they had been found in other quarters, also would have given us the good peace. Tell us about that and what exactly Hoover said. What was the Hoover thought or plan at Versailles? One of the things they had difficulty with at Versailles was uh, stopping the war. Uh, they went to the negotiating table, Germany, France, Britain, others, uh, and, and they were still determined to settle scores. Uh, still determined to get an advantage over one another, still worried about future hostilities. Hoover's attitude was, thank God this war is over, let's work on recovery. Uh, he didn't care uh, about uh, where things had ended uh, geopolitically. Uh, his attitude was, let's uh, get the railways going again, let's get the factories going again, let's make sure people are fed. Uh, the sooner we leave behind the hostilities of the war, the sooner Europe recovers, European recovery is good for America, America trades with Europe, the international financial system requires a stable Europe. Uh, so Hoover was just very practical about uh, uh, trying to force uh, other people around the negotiating table to see things in those practical terms and to work constructively uh, for, for rehabilitating Europe rather than for continuing the fight. Yes, and he came home a superstar. Today, we're, we're very concerned with fame. Fame wins elections. If someone is known, he or she wins. If someone is unknown, then the chances are, are pretty low. I, I think Hoover was one of the most famous people coming from outside politics into politics in the US history. And I want to ask you about his superstar status, how he ended up with one party instead of the other. This would be around 19, 20, 21, how he chose. And I'll read to you a poem, an American poem about Hoover. Um, this god, who kept the Belgians black bread buttered, who fed the world when millions muttered, 
Who knew the needs of every nation? Who keeps the keys of conservation? Who fills the bins when mines aren't earning? Who keeps the home fires banked and burning? Who will never win a presidential position because he isn't a practical politician? There's mockery there. Hoover, that's all. That is, let's doubt those who doubt Hoover. Hoover, Hoover was famous. Uh, he uh, wasn't a politician, and uh, he was probably as unlikely uh, a politician uh, as, as you could find. Politics, as you know, is uh, a team sport, and Hoover didn't like to work with other people. Uh, politics is a very tribal activity, and Hoover wouldn't belong to any of the conventional tribes, Democrat or Republican, liberal, conservative, internationalist, nationalist. He um, had his own view of America, and he wanted to be true to that. Uh, and he looked at the parties more or less as stepping stones to, um, uh, to his ambition to be president. He, by, I guess by personal uh, traditions, he was a, a Republican. His family had been Republican. His uncle who had raised him uh, had been a Republican. And the Republicans were more or less the party of business at the time. So I, it made sense that he go with the uh, Republican Party, and he did. But he did not um, ever have good relationships with the party grandees, with the party establishment. Uh, and he was always viewed as something of an outsider in Republican circles. Uh, yes, that's right. And that's something Margaret Hoover has also written about. He wrote a book about American individualism, which was Hoover's manifesto. And just in a word or two, because I want to be sure to get to the Great Depression, the big controversy, tell us about his, his manifesto um, in the early 20s. Hoover believed that what really made American America great in the first place uh, was its notion of individualism. Uh, and it wasn't a laissez-faire notion of every man for himself. It was the idea that everything great that happened in uh, the life of the country came at the beginning from individual initiative and individual genius, individual inspiration. And he thought that a society and a government should do everything it could to encourage in each and every individual the kind of striving and hard work uh, that uh, would allow a person to flourish and, and give whatever it was in the person to give. Uh, he believed that government should be set up to encourage that in every human being uh, regardless of race, creed, or economic status, and that it should do so by making sure that every individual had access to the basic necessities of life, that people had food, clothing, shelter, education, and whatever else they needed to get uh, a fair start in life. It was rooted, in fact, in uh, uh, President Lincoln's idea of the fair chance. And it was a, it was a very, I think, um, uh, sensible and uh, uh, admirable view of America, and it was the lodestar for Hoover uh, through the whole of his political career. And we will get to it later, but the irony of being the rescuer who is unable to rescue. Right? That, um, and it, it, you can feel the shadows of it before. Um, Hoover was Commerce Secretary under President Harding and Coolidge, and before we get to how he bridled um, uh, in the position, not quite powerful enough, um, and was, tell us a little bit w about what he did, because he was extremely active. The Commerce Department had a reputation of being kind of sleepy. It was relatively new, and it was said at the Commerce Department, you put the light on at the lighthouses, and you put the fishes to bed at night, right? And But Hoover, was a man of business, and he really utilized the position to w cause changes in industry and cause attitudes in industry to change. Could you say a little bit about that? 
The hardest part of this book to write was about the commerce years uh, of Hoover, eight years in that position. And it's because there is so much to talk about. There was just so much that he did in, in those uh, eight years, and there's so much material. I, I frankly didn't know how I was going to get uh, uh, through that, and I think that's why I'm the first guy to ever write a start-to-finish biography of uh, Hoover by himself, is because uh, it, it, there's just so much in there. But he, um, um, he basically laid the foundation for... Um, contemporary broadcast industry for both radio and for television. Uh, he laid the foundations of commercial aviation. He organized the nation's traffic systems. He uh, uh, laid the groundwork for the explosion of suburbs in America uh, in, in the middle of the century. Um, there was almost nothing that he didn't have his hand in in, in the government at that time. He was called uh, Secretary of Commerce and Undersecretary of everything else. Um, and, and he was uh, kind of greedy as Commerce Minister about uh, uh, the scope of his responsibilities. He was always trying to steal departments and uh, agencies and, and uh, uh, and, and jurisdiction from his uh, fellow cabinet ministers, which from time to time made him rather unpopular. Uh, but he had the confidence of both Harding and, and Coolidge, and in both of those governments, he was seen as the uh, force for progress and modernization because of his uh, relationship to all the new technologies that were coming on and, and uh, great projects like the Boulder Dam, now known as the Hoover Dam. So he, he was uh, empowered by both of those presidents to work on a lot of things well beyond the scope of what traditionally had been the Commerce Department. Uh, because he was effective and, uh, and, and uh, able to put the governments that they ran in a more um, bullish, progressive, uh, Light. And by progressive, I don't mean in a political sense, I mean more in the sense of uh, we're doing constructive things on behalf of the American people. Oh, oh yeah. Tell a little bit about the moment of television. Mm -hmm. it, Hoover was actually the first man on television. Um, they didn't even know what it was called at the time he was on it, but uh, the, the uh, uh, men who I think uh, were... I think, uh, I may be wrong about this, but I think it was R RCA who set it up uh, between Washington and New York. They set up a connection, and Hoover sitting in his office in Washington was seen and heard uh, at the same time uh, on a screen in New York. It was a huge story, made the front pages of all the newspapers here, um, and uh, uh, it was probably still another 15 to 20 years before it became commercially popular. Uh, but Hoover does have the claim to being the first guy to appear on screen. Well, w what you're getting at, Ken, and he gets at this so beautifully in the book, is uh, also the question of philosophy of government. Does the federal government cause change, or does it showcase change? And it, he was more in the showcase mode. This was a media opportunity, not just because he liked to see himself in an important situation, but because he, more than most members of the cabinet, at least, w would grasp the possibility of television in, in the 20s. Think, you know, and this, you, you want to ask, why was, you know, RCA with stock was very high. It's one of the famously high stocks of 29. And there's whole uh, rafts of economic work on this. Um, the question is, was RCA stock really, really too high or somewhat too high? Because what it promised was television. And it wouldn't be another 15, 20 years before we had television, but sometimes that's priced into a stock right now, the potential for something. And he, he got this. Um, we, we move now to, though, the question of, of being uh, Secretary of Commerce and Under Secretary of everything else and um, before we get to the Depression, a little bit about um, how he um, interacted with President Coolidge, particularly, and, and Mellon. Um, and I want to read something that you wrote, or a quote you wrote of Lou Hoover's, Mrs. Hoover's, 
because President Coolidge, um, whom I'll be representing for the minute, was a much more silent type and, and was a little unnerved when Hoover would come around and show how effective and knowledgeable and modern and good at business and popular and all he was. And uh, it was clear that Hoover wasn't going to stop at Commerce, right? And, uh, well, what about Coolidge? He only was elected his first time. Was he going to have two terms, or was Hoover going to take? Uh, so this is there between the two men of very different types. And Mrs. Hoover, and I've never seen this before, you undug this, um, heard rumors that Hoover was pushing Coolidge. The Commerce Secretary was pushing the president a little too much, and she said, Daddy is playing ball in a team, she wrote in a letter, in a family letter. And whether anyone persuaded him to run for the presidency or not, he certainly would not do it directly or indirectly, indirectly while Calvin Coolidge was still apparently thinking of it. For, of course, he would never plot against the man who was captain of the team. Mm. And we all, um, we were all disingenuous, every one of us, about our vanity and our pride. So I thought that was very, very compelling, and I'm sure both were true. Hoover would never plot against Coolidge, and of course he would. Yeah, he had no problem plotting against Coolidge. Um, the, the, one of the fascinating things about Lou Hoover, her, her uh, letters to her sons, which Amity just quoted, uh, were indispensable to me because Hoover himself, he wasn't a re you know an introspective type. He didn't keep diaries. He didn't write long letters to friends explaining how he felt about things. So if you want to know what the mood was in the family at any given time, you got to go to Lou and Lou's letters to her to her children, and that's when you really see uh, what's going on in the household. Uh, to an extent, Lou is a very good source, but there are times when she's a bit unreliable, and this is one, because uh, Hoover was ambitious, and uh, he uh, had started thinking about uh, replacing uh, Harding uh, in Harding's first term, and then I'm sure the moment that Coolidge was elected, he started thinking about when he was going to replace Coolidge. He was an ambitious man. Uh, and after the midterms in 1926, he started to actively organize uh, a, a campaign team uh, that uh, he did it in a stealthy way, but he, he started to lay the groundwork for his own presidency in 1928, and he excused it to himself on the grounds that, well, other candidates out there were organizing, so why can't I too, as long as I... Um, respectful of Coolidge, and as long as I'm not seen to be elbowing him to the wings. Um, and so he was doing this. He was having meetings with his stealth campaign team all the time, but whenever Lou came around, they'd stop talking politics. Mm. Uh, Lou didn't uh, really like the fact that he was so ambitious, and uh, she was of the view as... <laughs> uh, a remarkable number of people around Hoover were that uh, he was just climbing the, you know, up the slippery pole uh, uh, by, uh, he was being dragged up there by um, uh, other forces, not, not trying to climb himself. He was a man without ambition who was just serving the public, um, which wasn't at all the case. He was very deliberate and he got along very well with Coolidge. Uh, for the first couple of years that they worked together, but as soon as it became clear to Coolidge that Hoover was a man in a hurry, uh, their relationship uh, soured. And that's when you get quotes uh, from uh, Coolidge complaining about the, the boy wonder Hoover and uh, how this man had given me nothing but bad advice uh, for, for the last several years. Their relationship never really recovered, and Hoover, uh, Coolidge tortured Hoover uh, in the last year of uh, Coolidge's regime by not uh, saying that he was going to retire by, uh, even after he had announced his retirement, by refusing to endorse Hoover. And Hoover was scared to death uh, right up to the last minute that Coolidge was going to decide to run again, and Hoover would have to stand aside uh, 
because it would be the right thing to do. Oh, yes, exactly. And you, you tell that so wonderfully. Uh, it's not always given to us to pick our successor. Um, I want to move to the Great Depression, though, because this is the meat of your story and where you are most plausible, by the way. Um, let's let's start with that. Um, is Could you write a letter to that? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Um, the, in 1928, Hoover wins election. He was popular. He was a popular Republican. The economy is strong. 1929, he is inaugurated. Coolidge goes back to Northampton, Massachusetts. The stock market goes very high, double what it was quite recently to 381, and then it crashes in the end of August, or sorry, in the September, October, November 29, right? That's the beginning of the crash. And it goes on and on until all through the Hoover presidency until the market is down uh, more than 80%, I believe close to 90%, 40 something. That's so dramatic. Historians depict this as Hoover's fault. And what you do so wonderfully is you lay out the case that he almost rescued the economy, and that's why we need two more minutes two or three times, I think you say three times, so we give a bit to each of those, and that his successors, that would be, unfortunately, I'm sorry, President Roosevelt, to be say this in your house, President Roosevelt um, and the Democratic Party put the economy, you contend, back into a tailspin. So let's first talk about the three rescues and then what the successors did or wrong or could have done better. And then um, we'll begin to close out the session for um, questions. I wasn't going to talk about any of this in respect to the uh, venue, but <laughs> since you brought it up, um, after the markets crashed in 1929, um, Hoover did a series of things uh, designed to support public confidence. Uh, he saw that uh, in past depressions, the thing that had tended to drag them out was that people were afraid to trust the economy again after a market crash. They wouldn't spend money and everything ground to a halt. So after the crash of 29, he um, called businessmen to Washington and said, look, we're going to have a depression. Or we've had a stark market crash. We may have a recession after this, but recent recessions, all the recessions, in fact, since the Fed was established, Federal Reserve Bank in, in 1913, all of them have been short. So let's count on this one being short. And uh, you businessmen, don't do what you always do and lay off rafts of people just because times are bad. Let's just wait this out. You share the pain uh, with uh, your, your workers and, and we'll get through this. And, and the businessmen agreed and labor agreed that it wouldn't go on strike and and everyone agreed that we would stand firm uh, in in the wake of this market crash and that the crisis would pass in about six months and everything would be fine. Hoover was applauded by pretty much all opinion in America at the time, the, whether you go to Washington Post, the New York Times, the New York Herald Tribune, they were all unanimous in support of uh, Hoover's actions. In fact, they credited him with uh, doing something new uh, with the presidency, with uh, uh, sh what they called uh, adding a psychological dimension to the presidency. He was encouraging people. Uh, he, he was essentially saying, you have nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, and uh, and And in this way, they were all going to get through the crisis together. Unfortunately, uh, and despite all economic prediction at the time, it wasn't over in six months. It kept going on and on. And then there was, uh, in 1931, a new dimension to it when the European economy crashed. Uh, and that spread via the gold standard from Germany to the UK and eventually to America. And Hoover undertook a series of uh, very innovative and, and uh, at the time they were recognized as politically daring moves first to um, rewrite the terms 
of the Versailles Agreement and suspend all debt payments among company, uh, countries that, that had been involved in the war and to suspend all the reparations payments and essentially to put all of these issues of who owed what to whom uh, uh, to the side until the economy had uh, um, healed. Uh, and it worked for a time uh, again, and he was given enormous credit for it, but uh, again, it didn't last, and, and the old animosities resumed uh, their work in Europe, and the economy continued down. His last great effort uh, was to, you know, the centerpiece of it was the Reconstruct Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was designed to uh, help the banking sector, which was in pretty rough shape by 1932. And it was, uh, again, enormously uh, successful for a time. Um, in the last months of uh, Hoover's term, pretty much every economic indicator you wanna look at was on its way up. Productivity was on its way up, prices were stabilized, employment was coming back up, the Dow Jones went from, you're right, it was in, I think, point, 42 points or 44 points in June, and by October it was uh, at about 75 points. So everything looked to be going in the right direction. Then the election happens, Hoover loses. There's a Democratic Congress, and the Democrats um, decided that uh, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was giving money to bankers. That wasn't a good thing. They were bailing out, uh, the government was bailing out uh, bankers and, and industrialists and not looking after the people. So they started publicizing in Congress the names of the banks that were going to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation for assistance. And of course, when you start publicizing which banks are weak, people flee from those banks, and, it, um, and that's exactly what happens. So banks stopped going to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and as a result, um, the banking sector went back into a tailspin and the recovery stalled. A second reason that it stalled, and this is not my theory, this is from Barry Eichengreen, who's probably the best uh, economist on the subject, um, on the gold standard, was uh, Roosevelt's uh, uh, uncertain position on, on gold standard, whether or not he would keep America on the gold standard, caused a lot of uncertainty itself uh, in financial circles and caused uh, a lot of gold to leave the country, and that further undermined the recovery. Um, so in the interregnum between Roosevelt's uh, election in 32 and his swearing in in March of 33, this recovery that Hoover had got underway uh, began to collapse. And uh, Hoover had a whole bunch more plans to uh, counter that, including to quit publicizing the names of the Reconstruction Finance uh, Corporation's customers and things like that. Uh, and he tried to get Congress to work with him. Congress wouldn't work with him. And one of the things that I found in the course of my research was that um, the reason they wouldn't work with him was because they were all looking past Hoover to Roosevelt, and Roosevelt had been very clear with them that he wanted nothing to happen during the interregnum. He wanted to deal with the depression, uh, deal with the downturn on his own watch and solve it in his own way. He didn't want Hoover solving it before uh, he could get to office himself. And uh, as one Hooverite put it, uh, it was as though uh, the Hoover administration was trying to pull uh, this drowning economy uh, out of the water and that they got it back up onto the dock only to have the Democrats and Roosevelt kick it back in to the water to have the honors of rescuing it themselves after March 3rd, 1933. I know there'll be some good questions yes. about that. Um, it, before we go to questions, um, I want to mention we, we all biographers stand on the shoulder of biographers' shoulders. 
I want to mention George Nash again, who's done so much work minute by minute in Hoover's life, and that's one reason he never finished all the way, although he's done a lot of it, um, is, is the careful attention to detail. Um, Joan Hoff Wilson, the first writer, as far as I know, to suggest that Hoover was a progressive, and there is plenty of evidence for that, and that's what one thing Ken, Ken looks into and showcases, Glenn Johnson, um, Richard Norton Smith, and Margaret Hoover. This is all a, a collective effort. You're much more of a collectivist, clearly, than Herbert, uh, because we all, we all couldn't do what we do without working um, with one another. The last question for you has to do with President Trump, because we are here and now. Tell us about President Trump and President Hoover. Are there any similarities to any differences to people of business? Well, they are, as far as I know, the only two tycoons to make it to the White House. Um, and I think they have, each of them, problems as a result of their being tycoons. I want to say at the start, though, that I don't think they're very similar at all as, as people. Um, uh, Hoover was probably the hardest working chief executive of all time. Uh, and he revered the office of the president. He never embarrassed it at all during his time in power. And he uh, left with uh, a remarkably scandal-free record, uh, especially considering uh, some of the things that had happened not too long before him in the Harding administration, for instance. So he, he was a, a very, very serious and sincere and earnest public servant. And uh, I think that's just a little bit different than what we're, we're dealing with now. Um, but they were both businessmen. They were both tycoons. They were both very accustomed to running their own show and running it from the top and having people do what they said and, and, and a very sort of autocratic approach to operating, which is normal among uh, business executives. Uh, they both came to Washington and uh, were reluctant to work any other way than the way they always worked. And so for Hoover, uh, who was not only a businessman but a scientist, a trained geologist, he wanted to find the best way to answer a question, the smartest way, the most direct way to the problem, to an optimal outcome. And uh, he's, he's collecting data like crazy. He was uh, bringing experts and uh, calling conferences of, um, uh, of, of uh, experts in Washington constantly in order to and analyze public policy questions and to find the optimal result and then he would hopefully go to Congress and just get them to rubber stamp that. He didn't like politics, didn't want to have to deal with all the back slapping, glad handing, deal making that goes on in Congress all the time and you know they come out with all these compromise deals that are far less than optimal uh, uh, policy solutions and, and Hoover wanted to avoid that. Um, it didn't work. You can't get anything done in Washington without dealing with Congress. Uh, and, and the ones who have historically dealt with Congress best, like Lyndon Johnson, have got the most done. Um, it wasn't until the second half of his mandate that Hoover realized uh, he was going to have to change the way he worked. And he got uh, rolled up his sleeves um, and, and got down and dirty with Congress and actually got quite a lot accomplished. Um, the um, the uh, issue with uh, Trump is, is somewhat different. Uh, he also doesn't like to share power with Congress. He doesn't like to be overseen. Uh, uh, he, he likes to be front and center all the time. Uh, and his solution to trying to end run Congress is to tweet uh, or to hold a rally or um, uh, sign an executive order, he's going to run into exactly the same problems that Hoover did. You can't work that autocratically and autonomously in Washington. You have to deal with Congress. <laughs>
Very interesting. We thank this audience for your magnanimity. We're ready for questions. First question. How about this lady right here? I have a question. I have a question about his early life. Uh, uh, what were the influences in his childhood and in his environment that caused him to be a person with so much confidence, so much drive, so much ambition, and so much self-empowerment that he could achieve everything he wanted to achieve? It, it was a one stop sign town he grew up in, and, and uh, uh, a tiny little place um, with, without much to it. There were no theaters, there was a school, but there was uh, you know, no sports fields. There was uh, uh, very little in the way of worldly amenities. But his parents uh, were uh, fairly well educated. And they were community leaders. His mother was uh, a Quaker minister, and his father uh, was on the town council and so on. And so they were not very wealthy, um, but uh, they were empowered uh, within their community, and they saw themselves as responsible to the rest of the community. They saw it as their role to support people around them and, and to build a community. And so there was that example right from the beginning for uh, Hoover, even in those short nine years. Thank you so much. Um, and, and my name is Chris Gates. And thank you both for your scholarship and how you've opened up this important period of American history for all of us. I've got a question for each of you. And the question for Amity is, is there anything about Ken's scholarship that has uh, opened up anything about Calvin Coolidge or caused you to reconsider anything that you had thought about Coolidge up until uh, his work? And Ken, do you want to talk at all about the role of the Federal Reserve during the Hoover years? Ken reveals through quality research, the disingenuous aspect of Calvin Coolidge, I'll say that, um, but also then highlights the agony, as I started to say, it's not given to us to pick our successor, is it, usually, when we're in power? And when you turn around and leave, as, as Coolidge opted to, he might have run again, you expect the world will follow you and applaud you and say, wonderful man, foregoing power, and instead there's this deafening um, sound as they all run to follow the next person and leave you all alone. And that's what Coolidge was going through. That's so right. thank you, Ken. Uh, I want to thank Amity. I learned a lot from both her Coolidge book and from the, the Forgotten Man, and I don't think... Uh, I would have had the courage to follow where the research was uh, taking me on some of these questions around Hoover and the Depression if I hadn't seen Amity do it uh, before me. And so her earlier point about you know all biographies from being written on the shoulders of previous biographies is absolutely true. It all just is part of a big conversation and it builds and builds uh, over, over time. Uh, the Federal Reserve was very useful uh, at, at the early years of the um, Depression, and uh, the reason there was no bank um, collapses uh, of, well, there wasn't any major uh, banking crisis uh, until quite late in the Depression was because the Federal Reserve in Atlanta and then uh, in New York reacted uh, very well to signs of stress in the system initially. Uh, but then when things got really bad and some of the banks looked not just uh, challenged but actually insolvent, insolvent the Re Federal Reserve Bank didn't see it as its role to bail out insolvent banks and at that point it was kind of useless. on the point that he made also. 
with the inaction. 1932 election to inauguration in 1933. Well, we both are trying to get at the same thing, which is the uncertainty generated, generated when you have a shift, and that's true every time, right? Uh, so this is not all one person's fault or the other, but I in a time of economic crisis, of course, uncertainty matters more. Um, if they'd had a VIX index, it would have gone crazy. If they'd had right, if they'd had futures, so so that's what I worked on too. And since the Forgotten Man came out, and in the time you've been working on this, there are new indices being created in business schools to to look at uncertainty beyond this one measure, the VIX. And I believe it's Davis at the University of Chicago who's got an uncertainty index because uncertainty can do damage, so bold, persistent experimentation isn't always optimal. Oh, deliver, yes, we both, we, but um, I, you know, every president wants a clean, clean slate. It, it was just a particularly t tough time um, for, t for Roosevelt to turn around and um, ignore Hoover and his letter that said Roosevelt on it, missing one O. Um, and uh, you know who else has, has written about that quite well? And the person who first discovered it maybe is Jonathan Alter. Why, with all his brains, didn't Hoover avoid Vito Holy Smoot? Uh, you recall what I said about Hoover and politics and Hoover not really understanding or appreciating politics and not really wanting to work with Congress and the people on the Hill? Um, Hoover uh, let Congress run away with Smoot Hawley, and, uh, and, and they did, and that was uh, a part of his learning process. And uh, at the end of the day, the Smoot Hawley tariffs uh, were a real political defeat for Hoover, and they showed him to be not um, the the um, uh, political genius he was reputed to be when he when he went into office. Uh, that said, Smoot Hawley is now generally recognized to be uh, to have been hugely overestimated as a problem during the depression. It took uh, tariff rates in the U.S. from very high to slightly higher at a time when uh, international trade was uh, of really minimal importance to the American economy. So it really economically, it didn't matter. What, what mattered more was the fact that Hoover showed himself unable to command the Republican Congress and showed himself vulnerable to, um, uh, to, to a lot of the personalities on the Hill. Thanks. Um, I've been perusing your book. It's a terrific read. Thank you. Um, we also feature Mr. Hoover in our World War I exhibit for his astonishing contributions during that period. So we may be the house of the Roosevelts, but we also like to respect history. So here's my question. Um, how did Hoover and his fellow Republicans so underestimate Roosevelt in the 32 election? Um, Roosevelt had been re-elected governor in 1930 by 700,000 votes. Um, he had mastered the medium of radio. He gave great speeches, and although people knew he was crippled, uh, that did not seem to deter their support for him. So how, how did this happen, that, that Hoover and his associates did not recognize what a strong candidate he was? Hoover not only uh, thought Roosevelt was a weak candidate, he thought he was so weak that of all of the Democratic candidates that year, he wanted Roosevelt to win uh, because he thought he'd be uh, uh, the, the least opposition that the Democrats could bring forward. Uh, and he wasn't alone with that uh, opinion. A lot of Republicans believed that, and a lot of liberals believed it. Uh, Walter Lippmann thought that uh, uh, Roosevelt was more or less a parody of a politician, spouting platitudes, uh, talking out of both sides of his mouth, having no real convictions. Um, and, and that was not an uncommon view of Roosevelt at the time. FDR was said to stand for Feather Duster Roosevelt. He was a lightweight. Um, and 
And in a lot of respects, I went back and read all those campaign speeches. You can see why they had a low opinion of him. Uh, Roosevelt was talking uh, both sides of his mouth. He was attacking Hoover from the left one day, from the right the next. He was making a lot of wild uh, accusations about Hoover, including, this will sound familiar to those who have followed politics in America recently, um, he talked about uh, Hoover as being a crook. Um, and uh, he said he was a crook and he was working with the other five crooks who uh, uh, controlled the entire uh, economy in America at the time. Uh, these were not, you know, the... Um, uh, the the utterances of a, a, the next uh, Woodrow Wilson. He d he didn't come across to a lot of people as a very convinced, especially uh, the the more intelligent uh, of the uh, pundits as a as a credible candidate. But what Roosevelt did have, and that you allude to, was uh, a kind of a political uh, a genius. He knew uh, the business of politics. He knew how to go about. Uh, finding and uh, bringing together large groups of people in voting coalitions, which at the end of the day is what matters in politics. And he was uh, really a genius at that, probably as, as effective as anybody in the history uh, of American politics at that. And Hoover, not being a, pol a political type himself, entirely underestimated uh, the worth of those talents that Roosevelt had. And uh, it wasn't until late, until late in the campaign that he began to see that uh, uh, Roosevelt was far more effective than he had anticipated. Last question. Uh, you took us through the Depression. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about post-war and the war. Uh, second war? The second war. I know Hoover wrote a book, a 500 or 600 page book that was just published five years ago where he had very unorthodox views of uh, World War II and post-war, including that Pearl Harbor was not a sneak attack, that Roosevelt was looking for it as a backdoor to war, that we had no business in World War II, that we should have just let Stalin and Hitler, those two bastards, annihilate each other. Uh, do you think uh, the public will ever come around to that kind of thinking? No. <laughs> um, for this reason, uh, once history has happened, people have a really hard time imagining that it could ever have happened any other way. Uh, but uh, the, this book that Hoover wrote, uh, and was, it was never published, um, it was actually about a thousand pages, not, not five or six hundred, uh, and he wrote it obsessively uh, over the last decade of his life, um, is uh, an alternative view of uh, the start and the conduct of the Second World War. Um, and it was not really, I don't think it was, uh, 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 there was anything terribly outrageous uh, about it. I, I think that there was a time when um, uh, the Second World War might have been prevented, or at least that things might have gone another way. Um, there were, and I think it's generally recognized, that, that some of America's actions towards Japan were provocative, and Hoover thought much too provocative. Um, Hoover thought that uh, uh, Roosevelt was um, uh, giving encouragement to Britain and to France uh, in the lead up to the war, and as a result, Britain and France were playing a lot tougher with Germany than they needed to in doing things like guaranteeing Pol Polish independence. And, and Hoover did think that uh, Germany would eventually go to war, but he very much wanted him to go east, uh, wanted Hitler to go east, which was where Hitler was looking to go uh, originally, and it didn't matter much to Hoover that uh, that, uh, um, <laughs> that who, who was not a friend of, of Russia and, and not an admirer of communism. It didn't really matter much to him that Germany was looking to go east. And he would have been happy to see them uh, 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 exhaust themselves, uh, Germany and Russia, in a fight. Uh, so 
you know, it, it makes for a very interesting kind of counterfactual read of history, and it makes you think hard about, uh, uh, you know, whether things really needed to happen the way they did or not. Um, uh, Hoover was uh, a very intelligent man, very shrewd man. He hated Roosevelt, and that comes through all of that text, and, and there is parts of it that are, um, you know, a, a bit overwrought, shall we say, uh, but there are also a lot of interesting arguments in it. Well, we want to thank Mr. White. <laughs> wonderful, readable look into Herbert, and we want to thank Roosevelt House for your magnanimity again in hosting this session. Um, may our good mood here carry over into the world of politics. And I want to thank Amity Schley as well. Thank you very much.